Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, we are live on YouTube now. Okay. Yeah, I can see that message. Yogi, I'm uh, switching off. I've made you co-host. Uh, yes, sir. Sure, sure. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. I'm leaving then. Huh? Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, Raj, sir. I made you co-host. Uh, kindly check if you can uh, share your screen. Can see me no. Uh, yes, sir. I can see a uh, little bit. Yeah, it's fine. Can see. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, visible, sir. Yeah. Uh, I think Tilak sir and uh, Kartik sir have already joined. I need to accept them. Yeah, accept those two. Yeah. Sunita sir and a PPT? Uh, not actually sir. I'll just uh, call back one second. I can let others in. Uh, actually, like, uh, I can't see their names. That's what I'm searching. Like, uh, now I can't help you. Whoever is on Zoom, let them in. Uh, actually, okay, fine. Participant 100. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, hello, Tilak, sir. You can unmute yourself once. Are you able to hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Also, Kartik, sir. It would be nice if you just uh, check with your settings. Kindly unmute and talk. Hello, Kartik, sir. Can you hear me? We also request all the participants to kindly mute yourself, both audio and video. Hello. Hello, Kartik, sir. Is that you? Uh, so one second, uh, I'll just call Karthik, sir. Maybe he's having some issue. Uh, in meanwhile, uh, Tilak, sir. Yes. Uh, I'll just make you also like a co-host. You can also check with settings. Okay. So that. Um, Look, uh, is it? I'm talking to Yogi, Yogi right? 
yeah yeah yes sir yeah. okay i'm i'm not really comf- uh, uh, new, i mean used to these zoom settings i don't do any online meetings so sorry i'll not be able to do much of that any help of that sort of kind yeah fine fine it's okay sir then um, i can actually share it it's fine sir sure sure that'd be great please yeah okay you just say when you want the next slide to be Oh well, uh, if if it's a presentation, I can click. I've got the presentation open here, so I can I can do it from here as well. If it's yeah, so uh, later on we'll tell you to share it. Sure, sure. no problem. Uh, Raj sir, one second, you can close your s- screen share. I think uh, there are some sort of annotations on it. Yeah. Raj sir, one second. I'm calling Kartik sir. Okay. I'll be right back in a minute. हेलो 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 Hello.
Uh, hello, Raj sir. Actually, like, uh, I hope you can start it, sir. Uh, like, I'll be adding him in a minute or two. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You can just start it. Uh, you can uh, share your screen and you can start it. As uh, sir is the like first presentation, he can go with it. In meanwhile, I'll just add Karthik sir. He's the third presentation, right? So. Yeah, it's visible, sir. You can start it. Yeah, may I request all the participants to unmute sorry, to mute yourself so that there is no disturbance. Yeah, also, yeah, we can hear you. That's why you Please mute yourself. Also, you can put off your videos. Thank you, everybody. Welcome you all for this online education program on behalf of the Goa State Pharmacy Council and the Indian Pharmaceutical Association Community Pharmacy Division. Fiesta time in Goa, but yet lots of people have joined in. And we are very much thankful to you. We have got an overwhelming response for the CEP. Unfortunately, we had to stop the registrations before we could accommodate only limited. We have, yeah, we would like to pay tribute to all the pharmacists, to all the pharmacists who have gone, undergone these tiring times during the COVID and who have, some of them have laid down their life. Many of them have got affected, infected, and also their family members. But yet, all the pharmacists in the country have bravely put on a front and are continuing to serve the profession. We had a very good response from all of you. We have registered 300 participants today. As you can see, the percentages, we had uh, 130, we have 130 community pharmacists who are on this. From the industry, we have 54 participants. Please unmute, sorry, please mute yourself. We have 28 M farm students and we have 26 hospital farms, both public and working in private sector. And we have nine from academics and other miscellaneous. It's indeed a great pleasure to have all of you over here. I welcome you all. We would like to thank the team which helped with the logistics of this continuing education program, without whose help it was not possible to connect with all of you, answer all your queries, gather all your registrations and solve your queries. Thanks to all of these. Connected with. Uh, Indian Pharmaceutical Association <laughs> has recently Hello. completed 81 years. It was established in 1939. It is the oldest and largest premier pharmaceutical association in the country. It operates through 20 state branches and more than 46 local branches. It has uh, five divisions, the community pharmacy division, hospital pharmacy division, education division, the industry division, and the regulatory affairs division. Each of these are headed by divisional heads and a committee which look after their concerned area of work and do activities and work and advocacy related to their respective areas. Under the education division, we have dynamic IPASF, that is the Students Forum. It also has been doing tremendous work amongst the students as well as in the community for the profession as well as for public health. Now we represent the IPS Community Pharmacy Division and we have various projects and activities going on for the past two decades. 
we have the good pharmacy practices and training manual and accreditation of pharmacies and uh, training uh, we have the tb fac card and dots pharmacies project the consumer medicines education initiative and we conduct continuing education programs so we are associated with a whole lot of uh, forums and we work together with some companies and associations to bring forward to our pharmacists and patients this sort of activity this is the executive committee for the year 2022 which is led by mrs manjeri gharat who is the chairperson of cpd and we also have within the committee mr ratnadeep from goa and the others are some of most of them are community pharmacists and a few of them are academicians across the country you must be familiar with this this is ips uh, community pharmacy division e times which comes once in two months and we have been continuously publishing this from 2012 this is the latest issue which i'm sure most of you have received if you have not you can always ask to be put on the mailing list as well this will be available and the previous issues are available on ipas website the issue will be due in february this year we look forward to having publishing it IPCPD plays a stellar role in preparing all the material for the National Pharmacy Week for the last 15 years at least. And this is the CARAM poster that is a campaign for awareness on responsible use of medicines, specifically focusing on patients. We have uh, these posters in six regional languages and in English. We are doing this awareness since 2014. All these posters are also available in different languages on IPA's website. This is a handbook on responsible use of medicines, which was launched a few years ago. And this is also specifically made for patients, simplified for patients. This is a compilation that we have done, our publication. It's about community pharmacy practice across the world. So far, we have collected of 31 countries. This is part one. And we are in the process of accumulating for more countries. And in partnership with the government, IPA CPD has been for the past several years doing the DOTS TB project along with pharmacists. IP also works collaboration with FIP Pharma Bridge. And this we have given opportunity to various assists to do a month's practice rotation in pharmacies in different countries. Now you can see Ratnadeep in Australia a few years back and Sagar in Scotland. This is one of our pharmacists presenting papers as at the FIP because IPA also does mentorship and facilitators, facilitates pharmacists into doing a research activity. And these are some of the activities in pipeline. Some of them are new. Some of them have just been launched. That is the antimicrobial resistance campaign, lifestyle diseases campaign, Pharmacy practice research, training modules for pharmacists, mentoring pharmacy students, and of course, we are conducting webinars and continuing education. If you want to join in with us, we are looking for volunteers amongst pharmacists and those who are interested in helping us out, strengthening our uh, hands and assisting us, please do mail in to us. We are connected on social media through Facebook and LinkedIn. The other partner in this uh, continuing education program is the Goa State Pharmacy Council. And uh, the council has been conducting continuing education programs for past few years. And all of you have been giving tremendous response to these education programs, which most of the times we help hold them in Goa College of Pharmacy around once in three months. But last 10 months, because of COVID, we could not do it. But that has not stopped you from coming forward when we decided to do this online education program. Thank you all for your overwhelming response. So far in Goa, the Pharmacy Council has registered close to 2,000 B-Farm pharmacists, 2,500 B-Farms, and nine PharmDs. These are PharmDs who have done a six-year course at Scott Doctor of Pharmacy. Total, we have 4,500 plus pharmacists registered so far in Goa. I think most of you know that the Goa State Pharmacy Council's office 
it's a, a small office at the entrance of the active building on the ground floor in Bamboli. And the office staff who looks after it is Mr. Omkar Zambawlikar. And the registrar is Mrs. Mangala Kadam, who is uh, was retired recently as a senior pharmacist in IPHP. Please note, and as per the 2015 pharmacy practice regulations framed by PCI, it is mandatory to attend last two days, at least two days of continuing education program over a period of five years in order to keep your renewal of pharmacy registration going. But I'm very happy to note that many of you have piles and piles of certificates and you do not attend it just because you want to have that mandatory thing. It is because of your passion for having more knowledge. So with this, we are trying our best to bring it forward to you. There's some good news from um, the team of Co-op Medical College Hospital Pharmacy section. And this is a one day seminar, which is to be launched, to be held in Medical College on 28th February. Details will follow soon from Mr. Mahendra, whom you can contact. That's me. I'm a pharmacist in Hindu Pharmacy. I'm also the vice president, uh, ex-vice president and chairman of IPA, Community Pharmacy Division. I'm also the vice president of the Goa State Pharmacy Council and also the editor of IPA CPD Times. And with me is Dynamic Yogendra Kanchapu, who is a recent PharmD pass out. And he helps us with all the logistics and he has been a great help in hosting this program as well as communication, and all other things, nitty gritties, which our generation has certain deficiencies in handling the technology, but we are learning from him. Thanks a lot, Yogen. He's a clinical pharmacist, service pharmacist at Staffingley, New Jersey. He's also the executive committee member of IPA CPD, and he's also into FIP, that is the International Pharmacy Federation, the Young Pharmacist Group, and he's also closely associated active member of IPA Students Forum and is also associated with our e-times. There are some housekeeping rules. Uh, I request you to please keep your microphones and videos muted throughout. If you have any queries or questions to ask to the speakers, please type it in the chat box or in YouTube, you can type it in the message box. If there is time, we will try our best to get your queries answered. So today there will be three lectures on various topics. We have three expert faculty with us. And towards the end of the three lectures, we will share a Google form link in the chat box. With that, you can fill up the feedback form and submit. And do become a member of IPA and join us in our activities and support and strengthen our hands in that. So thank you for participating as I go to the next. Manjiri, are you with us? I think she'll join later. She's the chairperson of IPA CPD for the past uh, around eight years. She's in charge and principal of the KMK College Polytechnic in Ullasnagar, Maharashtra. She has been the vice president of CPD and she's also, it's a great honor for all of us that she's newly elected as the vice president of International Pharmaceutical Federation, that is FIP. She's the immediate vice president of the community pharmacy section of FIP and also an executive member of CR Farm Forum of FIP, that is the Southeast Asia Regional Pharmacy Forum. Now we will move on to the first speaker. In terms of revenue, the pharmacy retail market in India was valued at around 1000 billion rupees in 2016, and now it's projected to reach. 2,300 Indian rupees uh, billion by 2024. 
it is expanding at a compounded annual growth rate of around 10% in the next 5 years the market pharmaceutical market is majorly occupied by unorganized local players however the unorganized sector is anticipated to face intense competition as we can see from organized players as well as online retailers our next speaker is a pharmacist and a pharmacy informatic professional who has practiced and worked in australia and india for more than a decade with an experience in managing retail and hospital pharmacy in australia and working in the field of information technology in deploying electronic medication management in india australia and us recently he has come down from australia and he has set up his own pharmacy medox in hyderabad which is a professionalized pharmacy carrying out various professional activities with his rich experience he has been able to start and push this off so today's presentation he is going to talk about the current situation in retail pharmacy and how qualified pharmacists can take a paradigm shift leading to more consumer satisfaction and improve the respect for the profession in india and at the same time increase your income as compared to pharmacists run by non pharmacy professionals the time when the entire landscape of pharmacy practice is changing with e pharmacies cropping out in india and pharmacists out there can change the way pharmacy business is done that is more than a medicine seller you can become a customers health consultant so with this i introduce our speaker mr tilak sairam gajendran to proceed with his presentation please share your, share your screen yes thank you and welcome yogi can i um, uh, click and then the screen will uh, slides will go up Uh, just a second sir i'll just uh, give you the remote control so you can uh, do that okay uh, see sir can you actually do it i just gave you yeah can you do it uh, just scroll okay yeah. i just go through that uh, slide show yeah that's it that's it okay let's go cool. all right uh Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as uh, Raj sir introduced me, this is Tilak here. So I'm the founder of uh, Medox Pharmacy here at Hyderabad. So I just back from Australia uh, in the past two years and was busy setting up this pharmacy. And uh, it's a really a great um, journey for me to start with. So let's proceed with the presentation as such. Okay. All right. So let's look at the current practice and statistics in relation to community pharmacy setup here. And we'll look at the strategies that can be practically implemented in retail pharmacies across India, which includes personal labeling, uh, ancillary or cautionary labels. medication counseling medication profiling for the customers and like as we do in western countries we can include the smoking cessation program management of obesity which is a very uh, important step because uh, in india it's uh, i'll discuss it in the slide that obesity is an increasing right now and uh, management of hypertension we can do management of diabetes in the pharmacy and we can talk about consumer medicine information which is basically uh, in the layman's language how the customer will understand what what he is taking or he she is consuming when the doctor has written the prescription uh, i'll also talk about dose dose administration aid which we have uh, we are planning to implement in our pharmacy uh, which is uh, in the uh, in the coming slides so future implementation uh, there are immunization services which can be based on the government decision and uh, sunita madam is going to talk about that in the next uh, presentation i believe uh, so we have the covid vaccination coming so uh, and thanks to the indian government that they have included uh, pharmacists in the panel as well to uh, immunize people but there are a lot of other immunization services which the government has to give us like like uh, investing countries like us and australia 
we do implement all the vaccinations. So that uh, work from the doctor has been taken over by uh, many pharmacists uh, in their in the community pharmacy practice. And a schedules to be created uh, by the government should be at par with Western countries like the pharmacists funding medicines. But um, as as everyone knows, the practical situation is different because we don't have many pharmacy pharmacies who have pharmacists practicing there. Uh, Yogi, can you uh, actually take over? Because I don't know why it's skipping many slides. Uh, hello, sir. You can hear me, right? Yeah, I can hear you. I can. Hear yeah, you. yeah. It's fine. Like uh, I can just scroll it. Okay. No. Uh, no. Not scroll, but actually, I want it to be uh, like a um... remote access, right? Yeah, but it should be like on click. Yeah. Yeah. One sec. One sec. One sec. Okay. Like um, Manjri ma'am and um, Sunita ma'am are adding. Once again, I'll just uh, sure. add them and give you the access. That's it. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's fine, sir. Now you can do it, I think. Okay, sure. Yeah. All right. Yep. So I'm just going through the ones which I've discussed. Yeah, okay, sir. So uh, medication therapy management is also another um, great area of practice, which uh, it's uh, very well developed in Western countries and it's still developing. And uh, so we do, uh, the pharmacists who become an accredited pharmacists do uh, check with the drug interactions, uh, drug drug interactions, drug food interactions, and all those aspects with any person's medication. It can be in the uh, customer's or patient's home, or it can be in the pharmacy as well. So, which could be implemented in India, and uh, we can talk. Uh, asthma management can be practiced here as well in future, and osteoporosis management. But I'm not going deep into those anticoagulation services, etc., because uh, right now we can stick on to this scope. Uh, because here, um, still those services are still in the uh, very primitive stage here. But these do. Uh, I have seen many pharmacies here who actually do uh, measure blood pressures and you know do the blood sugar levels using the normal uh, machines available. And of course, uh, so smoking cessation program is is something new to Indian market. But yes, it can be done because it doesn't involve anything very like you know um, uh, like asthma management where we have to measure the FEV on and FEV two and all those things and or bone density and osteoporosis etc. So let's look at the statistics of India. So if you look at that, there are more than like 850,000 8, uh, independent pharmacy retail stores across India. And these stores fulfill about 60% of the medicine needs of the country. And brick and mortar stores like what we have apart from online are responsible for 99% of the medicine sales every year here. And this value of retail pharmacy is going to reach nearly 2.9 billion rupees by 2022. And you see the organized retail pharmacy, like uh, market size is estimated about 2,600 crores. That includes like Metplus or Apollo or uh, Guardian or, you know, all those um, organized uh, pharmacies. And India basically accounts for a substantial proportion of the global um, disease burden, which is 18% of the deaths and 20% of the disabled uh, dallies, adjusted day life years, like, like permanent disabilities and that sort of conditions. And unfortunately, pharmacists remind the untapped resource in India less than one per thousand people. So this is the references for that. Um, so what's the current practice as everyone is aware? It's a prescription, it's official or unofficial or a WhatsApp image or oral request comes through either a pharmacist if it's available in the pharmacy or a non-pharmacist just understands the medicine, who understands the medicine, checks the inventory for stocks, looks for the substitute confirms availability and supplies the stocks and payment and gets the payment from the customer 
if the pharmacist is there, he may, may, may or may not give a counseling. A non-pharmacist, I don't think he'll be able to give a counseling until unless he has a lot of experience understanding that medication. So let's look at this label. It's just an apple cider uh, uh, aloe vera juice. Even for that, you, you have a label in, in India, like, okay, you can, uh, you have to direction of uses adults 15 to 30 mils for twice daily. But for medicines, we don't have a label. But that's unfortunate because in, in Western countries, it's very important that each person has gets a personalized labeling or because when, when the doctor writes, they may not be able to understand the handwriting, especially in our country. Uh, we still don't have, we, we do have online uh, uh, prescriptions now, but uh, apart from that, uh, generally it's more handwritten prescriptions and still the doctor's handwriting. Sometimes the people don't understand for that matter, even pharmacist has, has a tough time to understand certain medications. So I would say for the customer who is unaware of the medical jargons or medical uh, terminologies or medicine, it's probably best to label uh, the medicine whenever a prescription comes through. And this is what we do in Medox Pharmacy right now here in Hyderabad. So when the prescription comes through, uh, we label it with generic name. Uh, we have the brand name in the brackets. We have the batch number and expiry and the price as well. So this is the instruction where you get um, whatever the doctor writes. So two tablets, uh, this is just for paracetamol only four times a day when required, but we also give an extra information like maximum of eight hours and 24 hours. So that comes up with the dispensing ID and we have the sort of track it down and we have the customer's name, which is Mr. or Mrs. And we have the doctor's name as well. Or the, and we have all this uh, details of the pharmacy and also the pharmacist who has dispensed it. So this is very much important, which helps the customer to understand how to take the medication and uh, and also in the next slide, I'll talk about cautionary labels. So, the, so like for example, this helps like in the, in the same house. If you have uh, one person taking a different dose of the same drug, so for each person, if there's a personalized labeling, it confirms that they have to take only one tablet or two tablets. What is required? <clears throat> Okay, so let's go to cautionary labels. So apart from the cautionary uh, labeling of the medications, we do also stick on some cautionary labels, which is used in uh, West, uh, Western countries. So basically like you have uh, this medicine may cause drowsiness, say uh, consumers taking in benzodiazepine or even for that matter, other. So that may cause drowsiness, they should not drive or operate any machinery. So this helps the consumer to understand what he's uh, taking and so that there's no accident happening because of the medications. So because if, if that's not explained, there, there are chances that there are a lot of other, other incidents may happen. So there are, there are plenty of cautionary labels which can be given to the customer for each and every medication is a cautionary label. And we have like swallow hole, just in case if it's an entry coded tablet or a film coded tablet or slow release tablet, or it's like special handling is like, uh, if you have methotrexate, like an anti-cancer medication, uh, it should not be handled or tretinoin for that matter. And like you have 3A, there's a lot of cautionary labels which should be give, uh, actually stuck onto the medicines which helps the customer to understand the common side effects or even the way it should be taken. That's really helpful for the customer. Okay, so let's look at the medication counseling part. So we at Medox Pharmacy basically, and even in Western countries, we use motivation interviewing technique. This as pharmacists can, you can use it. That really helps you understand um, like uh, what the patient understands about the medication. So ask them, what did you, what did your prescriber tell you about the medication for? What did your doctor, how did, how, how did the doctor tell you like how to uh, take this medication, whether it's a morning, afternoon, then what did the prescriber tell you to expect the side effects or how the treatment is working, what problems or symptoms the medication is supposed to help uh, and what is the medication supposed to do to you? So if it's an antibiotic, if it's an, uh, say your infection is getting cured, if it's a blood pressure medication, you don't have any, I mean, uh, blood pressure is under control and you ask them, um, but did the doctor tell you uh, the directions? If so, do you understand what it is? With two times a day, is it 
after lunch and uh, morning and night or is it lunch and night so and all those information and what good or bad effects so you talk about the side effects the doctor explain it to you so this is an open ended question to the customer so what ha what happens here is the customer opens up so if the, if the doctor really didn't explain any medications about, about, about any medications so then they say so you can and in my situation here in hyderabad they they asked me uh, so you can explain about this medication the doctor didn't have time to talk about this and i do explain about that after that so this opens up the customer so let's continue with the medication counseling so core communication principle in word and medication motivation and counseling is it's a bit slow actually the slides okay so first uh, the reeds principle which is roll with resistance i'm just giving you an example um, so let let's see if a customer comes up and says um, sir i'm i've been asked by the doctor to start with the insulin and uh, i know uh, if the person is starting the insulin it's going to be the end of his life because all other medicines are not working and this is the state of mind of a customer who talks to you so in that case you don't say no 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 sir your oh, ma'am you can use the uh, insulin it will not um, it will not cause cause any problems we have a lot of people who are uh, using it and you should use it and that's why the doctor said don't go don't go in that rate that route because the the customer actually or the patient expects you to roll with the resistance and he he thinks that the pharmacist is trying to sell the medicines to him and not actually is not is not a cons consultant to me or helping me with what I, what i need to understand so just say fine sir no problem um, i i think uh, there are a lot of people who are using insulin so uh, i'll tell you the advantages and disadvantages of using insulin and you can take up the a decision so don't don't express any resistance express empathy towards the patient so tell them okay so i understand your notion about using insulin but uh, there are a lot of people who have used it and they have got a good control of their diabetes every uh, condition now and it really helps them that's uh, expressing empathize uh, empathy to them and avoid arguing with the customer and develop discrepancy so uh, discrepancy in this case is you tell the customer of the advantage about the advantage and disadvantage and they and let them decide and tell them so it's it's or ma'am you it's your final decision whether you want to go ahead with using the insulin or not so this gives an uh, upper hand for the customer or the uh, patient so he thinks that he's not trying to push the sales but he wants um, us to get better or he wants us the our diabetic condition to be under control so next is supporting self efficacy i'm just giving another example for in this case so for example if there's a person who is uh, wants to reduce the weight and he comes and tells you um um hatilak like, i've just reduced the weight 5 kilos in the past one month so i just say you what you have to do is just encourage that sort of attitude so self efficacy is like that's great you're doing good you doing uh, great with your diet with your exercise and you're reducing weight and that will help you in resolving many other health issues so this is the way we have to use our core communication principle in in our pharmacy practice as a pharmacist so that really helps and uh, i can see a change in my own practice here so let's continue with the medication counseling uh, so we talk about the medication name the use of it we ex we tell them the expect expected onset of actions many people ask you how long will it take the medication to act so i just say yes it will take start working in 15 minutes so once it's like uh, digested in your stomach so use layman terms so and give them the understanding of the medication route dosage form so dose and administration schedule so there are people who are asking who have asked me here uh, for that matter even in australia if there are like um, they're not well educated so can you take a suppository by mouth so you are you need to tell them about how to use it then you tell them how to like for preparing and administering so that's like mainly um, an uh, insulin say insulin injection uh or talk about missed doses this is very much important in uh, oral contraceptive pill like if the uh, patient is on antibiotic the effectiveness comes down so they need to use alternate method of contraception so you talk about the precautions while administering the meds like latex allergy if they avoid using gloves and that sort of thing or uh, 
potential common adverse effects like with antibiotics you can tell them about diarrhea like a good lot of examples to talk about you talk about the potential potential drug interactions as well if there is any like uh, as a pharmacist you should uh, like you can use a lot of open resources like drugs.com or any rxlist.com and it tells you about various drug interactions and if if you feel that the uh, he's your regular customer you can talk about you look it up in your history uh, and uh, whether they're taking these medicines and you can check up for drug interaction and if you are um, good enough for radiological and laboratory procedures you can also talk about that and also talk about storage conditions so like uh, for as example eye drops you can use it uh, keep it on a shelf, cool dry place in 28 on uh, and you have to discard it after 28 days that's not uh, good good enough for after after 28 days so these are the common you know they talk about storage conditions and you can talk about disposal as well so how to dispose uh, the medicines just don't put it in the dustbin you can dissolve it in the hot water and then pour it the um, pour it in uh, like in a newspaper uh, it absorbs it and then store uh, put it in the dustbin rather than putting it in the water body and then you know you have all this antimicrobial resistance coming up everywhere because of that or like if you using antibiotic or there are a lot of other medication which can go to the animals who, which live in um, you know water bodies and etc and you have to talk inf- information which is unique to the specific individual as well if it's if there is one necessity so uh we also as as pharmacists can provide medication profile um in our pharmacy so this actually here at medox we do that and uh, what we do is it uh, we have a software which picks up the information for the customer uh if they are regular our regular customers what's the generic name what it's given and the brand name in brackets and what it's given for uh, how to use it whether it's a morning afternoon evening and night dose and special directions like as i said uh, in the labeling section you could see the paracetamol maximum eight tablets in 24 hours for the 500 mg and you can put for 6 uh, 650 like maximum six tablets in 24 hours um, so all that information can be given for this uh, in the medication profile so with medication profile what what's the use of this is basically uh, when you give this as a print out for the customer when he goes if he needs to go to a new doctor or if he's uh, if he needs to go to an hospital for any situation he can give this to the uh, doctor and they'll be able to help um, it helps the treating doctor to understand what's the real problem and um, and why is he using these medicines and if he needs to stop it or change the dose etc we also mentioned about allergies which i have not mentioned yet sorry for that but uh, because that that really helps uh, the patient this as you as you aware as pharmacists if they are allergic to any medicine uh, like a penicillin allergy they have 20% cross sensitivity with cefosporins so we can also i'm going to talk about smoking cessation program this can be implemented in your pharmacy um, i believe there are still a lot of smokers in india do and um, so smoking cessation program uh, if you look at the statistics we have like as per the report in 2018 has about 266.8 million people who use tobacco and 48% ha- of the death may occur due to this uh, cardiovascular conditions or cerebrovascular disease and nicotine activates the neurotransmitters as you know and leads to increase in adrenaline also which basically increases the bp and heart rate and tobacco also contains like about 40 40 types of carcinogens and clinical intervention is required for these people so we need to cl- uh, classify them as those who are unwilling to quit or smokers who have already quit and they have uh, come again or those who are really willing to quit quit the smoking process and into an uh, interview by them asking with five ways ask them advise them assess them assist them and arrange the medications for them. so if you look uh, continue with the co smoking cessation we use uh, something called fagastrom test in uh, in australia and that's even used in the united states and canada and every, every developed country so based on these questionnaires we come up with a po- uh, point system and based on the points uh, as you can see it shows up whether it's under 10 10 points is highly dependent or 6 points moderate dependent etc etc okay so um you able to hear me yes sir we can hear you 
Is everyone able to hear me? Yes, okay, okay. Yeah, there, there was a uh, uh, thing. Yeah, yeah. There was a pop-up coming up saying that um, internet is unstable. That's fine. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah. So check with the customers the following before you give NRT. Uh, oops. Skip the slide. Okay. So check the check with the customers. <clears throat> Are they taking any other medicines? Uh, if they're taking medicines, we need to be wary of that because uh, smoking does uh, uh, increase the effects of uh, de decrease the effects of like beta blockers, for example. Or they're using any uh, any medicines for uh, you know pre uh, blood pressure or, or uh, heart, any heart conditions or for that matter so if smoking what happens is it actually de uh, uh, decreases the effect of the medicines but once they start nicotine therapy the effect may be increased so those are just may, may be necessary and pregnancy or breastfeeding it's contraindicated it's a category d condition so medication so in that case we mostly uh, ask pregnant or breastfeeding uh, mothers to uh, avoid the nicotine replacement therapy and more of a um, cold turkey method uh, or like it's more about Okay, uh, it's, it's a bit slow. Uh, whether they have asthma, diabetes, or heart problems, as uh, with the same as medicines, uh, we need to adjust the dose based on the, uh, once the customer or the patient stops uh, smoking. And we have to look out for uh, like if they have sore throat, the gums, or uh, you know, lozenges will not be very useful if they have in the mouth. <clears throat> and um, okay, uh, if they're smoking more than 10 cigarettes a day, based on the Phagostrom test, we decide if we're going by with a patch or lozenges and those doses based on the number of cigarettes they smoke. And if they have any dentures or recent dental work, Yes, uh, the gums may affect it. The lozenges may affect uh, gums, especially because it sticks on uh, sticks onto the mouth, and uh, that's important. Um, and do we have do they have a counseling program? So basically, uh, NRT itself is not just an alternate to smoking. Uh, it needs to be weaned off slowly. So we need to maintain that. So let's look at the management of obesity. Um, so if you look at the stats, there are more than 135 million people affected with obesity in India in 2018 study. By 2030, it will surpass the US as a country with the second highest number of obese children. That's a strange, uh, but true. Um, reasonable and safe weight loss goal is about 10% over six months. Um, so we look, uh, we look at weight management service, we need to do a strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat analysis required to start the service. Is it real, uh, what, are the, what are our strengths and uh, weaknesses, all, all those aspects. We, we need to define a business plan, uh, how it needs to be done. And we need to have a mission and vision for that. Description of the service for the customers. Organizational structure, like who is, uh, if we have enough um, pharmacists or uh, there are like uh, pharmacy technicians who are available to talk about the different aspects of the plan. Uh, whether they are free to do this um, or we need to do the financial analysis if you need to pay for those pharmacists or the uh, non-pharmacy staff. We also need to understand the scope of practice if it's uh, hindering any other, um, speak with other doctors around or like, you know, if they have that practice, uh, whether they are the doctors are happy to re um, um, send their patients uh, with respect to weight, weight loss management in our pharmacy. We need to have a documentation method as well. And continuous quality improvement is very important and we need to have a marketing plan. So marketing plan is basically, you uh, talk about uh, this um, obesity management program to all the doctors around or the gyms uh, nearby and that will help you to fetch more customers for that.
So uh, with the continuation of an obesity management program, it's generally a 12 week management program. So device customer visits once a month. <clears throat> Plan could be involved uh, with behavior and support system. The nutritional components, uh, components what they can, they're supposed to have with the daily food and um, teach them label reading. Label reading is nothing but uh, uh, when they look at a product from a um, uh, buying perspective, uh, check how much of trans fat is there or how much of carbs is available in it, how much of proteins is there, how much sugar is there. So that basically you need to uh, help them out and we need to talk about the vitamins and mineral supplements which help in reducing the obesity. And we need to talk, talk, even talk about heart healthy diet uh, for the customers. And we need to talk about even self image and the confidence they should build. Like do not go down if you're uh, obese, but once you come back to normal, you'll be fine and that sort of thing. And we need to do the meal, meal planning as well. Even help uh, actually uh, when in the pharmacy, if you have a dietitian who can help help with this or combine with the dietitian, it also helps the customer to understand more about their food habits as well. And what and we need to talk about physical activity, uh, 30 minutes or 45 minutes at least. And if there are any medications that need to be prescribed by the physician. So what are the sources, community sources? So if there's a discussion forum or online discussion forum, or if there's a community group who are interested in weight loss, we can link them up to that. And from that could be from your pharmacy or from somewhere else as well. Uh, so they, they join together and, you know, they can do a lot of activities together. Not in these COVID times, of course, but uh, once uh, once the COVID is finished, uh, fingers crossed by end of uh, middle of next year, uh, hopefully. And uh, a lot of things can be implemented like that. And we can even take them out for eating out and overall health and maintaining the lifestyle change. So once the business back, sorry, it's gone fast. Uh, Yogi, can you go to the, uh, uh, yeah, no, thank you. So um, completed, it should be reviewed by the owners to ensure it meets the goals, vision, and overarching pharmacy operations aspects. So let's look at management of blood pressure, hypertension. Uh, so there are about 2,007 uh, million people right now um, affected with um, blood pressure issues in India. And uh, men being more than women, the lifestyle interventions is an important aspect. When I when, it, when customers do come to, uh, and we have already implemented these things in our pharmacy. So I talk more about lifestyle interventions to them, like um, take less salt, have at least uh, half an hour to 45 minutes walking every day. Uh, so that's important. And here they take the medications regularly. What we do is uh, we talk about these things and we, we talk about weight loss aspects, <clears throat> the diet, diet which is rich in fruit and vegetables, <clears throat> less saturated and total fat. And we also talk about uh, that sodium should be less than six grams in 24 hours and potassium intake. Uh, so increase po potassium to 4.7 uh, grams in 24 hours. Especially uh, we, we, uh, we check that what medication they take. Uh, if they are on any like uh, diabetic medications or uh, even like and CKD, we, um, we make sure we don't recommend any much higher amount of potassium. So I, I do uh, do a cautionary label uh, with all this ARB and ACE inhibitors as well, like do not take potassium supplements. And I have a list of uh, food which contains high potassium Indian foods. So and that I share with my customers uh, so that they know that they're not supposed to take high potassium levels as well in the diet. And we talk about physical activity to them and um, even alcohol consumption. So like no more than two drinks daily uh, and one for women, men and one for women. So let's continue with the man hypertension management. So how we develop the service, basically we look at the scope of the service. Uh, whether we, we can measure BV pulse and orthostatic BV. For orthostatic BV, you need to have a bed. 
for and we uh, we give them about patient uh, leaflets on lifestyle modifications or information we share it with them and uh, as uh, many of um, uh, the non people uh, to me know that we have published um, a website uh, medoxpharmacy.com and it has a lot of patient education materials on uh, li- uh, on blood pressure and many other aspects so we ask our customers to go through our website and we also counsel them on medication so as as i talked about like um, if they are on any arb or as we put them a cautionary label of potassium supplements not to be taken until advised or uh, if there's a partial hypertension with any uh, thyroid diuretics that sort of aspects uh, we also talk about medication adherence uh, so that they don't stop any medications just just because they are, they look normal they don't feel any dizziness like they feel the bp is normal that's not true you need to adhere to the dosage and you should not increase or decrease as as per your own um, wish it needs to be done by the doctor and we also monitor for medication side effects if com- someone comes up with a dry cough with an ace and a beta we do recommend them to uh, speak to the doctor with a letter stating that 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 with a professional letter to the doctor uh, saying that this could be due to bradygnin inhibition and uh, please do change the medication doctor and some of doctors have taken up uh, which i'm happy to um, tell you in front of you and they change do change the medication and they actually <clears throat> to be honest they actually Uh, tell the customers that you have a pharmacist who is a very well caring person and that really actually motivates us to do more <clears throat> excuse me chicken sip of water so uh, as i said patient education materials is available in the website also we incorporate the, this into the workflow of pharmacy the marketing the service right now what we're doing with the marketing uh, in our case is more uh, doing it with the um, word of mouth even while they well we we, we give the bb medications to them we create a physician referral plan so we have um, like uh, when they, when they tell about tell us about their physician we do a referral thing for them like uh, if there's any issues with the medication also we ask a couple of doctors in our area to refer the bp uh, patients for uh, measuring but if uh, if they feel that uh, that could reduce their burden but otherwise we don't so this is our business plan and we uh, as pharmacists you can do this uh, in your pharmacy so make sure you have the good uh, good quality uh, bp machine if you're measuring orthostatic you need to have a plant bed and then we need to give them the uh, patient education materials and we have to create more referrals from the doctor if uh, all the doctors in your areas are interested in it so let's look at the, the diabetes management uh, look le- looking at the stats there are about 69.2 million people who have diabetes in 2015 here in india and 98 million maybe may have diabetes by 2030 so overall goals we need to have in diabetes management is the hb1ac should be less than 7% and as this decreases like microvascular complications like nephropathy or retinopathy etc and the goal is also to reduce macrovascular complications like stroke and uh, you know uh, ckd and all those things and most indian gold would be less than 6.5% especially if this patient is young and long, uh, and there's no uh, significant cardiovascular diseases and less than 8% of hb1ac if uh, they have a strong history of hyperglycemia episodes and bp goal should be less than 140 by 80 and lower goals recommend for younger patients like 130 by 80 and ldl hdl uh, they get the reports in our in our pharmacy what they do is uh, they get lip reports uh, from reputed uh, labs or wherever they go and uh, we keep uh, we keep a track of that in our in, in our software and uh, and then with both hypertension and diabetes what we uh, we we do here is uh, we record all the information for each customer in our software <coughs> and Uh, after six months or like three months, whenever they ask for a report, we generate a tabular column as well as a graph for them. Um, uh, like 
it's just started so i'm not any publish anything right now here so we do generate graphs uh, we are planning to generate graphs and tablet columns for them and we give it to them so that you know like uh, when they go to the doctor the doctor can see the trend based on the uh, medications if there's there's needs to be any change uh, they can do that so uh, we also talk about smoking cessation uh, for customers if they're smoking and they have diabetes so and we do the smoking cessation program for them. So uh, I can uh, tell you that uh, we have uh, two customers who have completely quit the smoking in, in our pharmacy. And one, uh, one is an elderly gentleman of uh, 75 plus and the other one is uh, like 40, 45 plus. And they're really happy with that. And this, uh, they even gained weight and uh, they look much better right now. So let's continue with the diabetes uh, management. So primary counseling concepts uh, involves talking about hypoglycemia symptoms, hypoglycemia symptoms, as you're aware of it. I'm not going to discuss about the clinical aspects. So uh, hypoglycemia, if the symptom uh, like BSA is less than 70 milligrams or symptoms uh, with symptoms or less than 60 milligrams. So preferred treatment of hypo 15 grams of glucose or even glucobeta bolts helps, um, helps with the customer. Then we also talk about glucagon kit if it's required. Um, not much here in India because we don't have, uh, I didn't get, have any experience here. So we also talk about in hyperglycemia, classic symptoms, what happens if the blood sugar is high. Um, we also talk about lifestyle modifications with the customers, like high fiber foods, lean, lean meat as a large part of diet, minimize saturated fats, sugar sweetened drinks snacks, extra, eat in small portions. Other counseling points we use here is we talk about the medications, uh, um, like um, how to take it before food, after food, what happens if, uh, if the blood sugar is low and insulin injection technique. Uh, it's, gen it's generally better to have the insulin uh, done in the abdominal area, not in thighs or arms or anywhere because absorption is good and how to store it. So it doesn't mean that you need to store the insulin just in the fridge. You can take it out and keep it um, in a cool room temperature um, below 25 degrees for at least 28 days. And one, after one month, you can discard it. Uh, we also talk about the self-management education and what happens if you're sick like because your insulin uh, requirements are different and your blood sugar shoots up. We also talk about the food care and how to take care of your food and importance of adherence. Just go to the previous slide, please. Okay. Adherence to medications. Uh, continue with, uh, diabetes management. We also, we if you're starting it, we need to do a proof of concept. So we need to in, uh, educate the staff uh, about needle stick injury because uh, when you're dealing with it, make sure you don't know who the patient is. It may be HEP positive or even HIV patient. We don't know. So we need to talk about like how to be safeguard from needle stick injuries. <clears throat> and um, Well, this is in context with uh, with heavy vaccines. Of course, uh, most of the staff, uh, I mean, not right now here in India, but in Western countries, most of, most of the staff are heavy vaccinated already. And he, even here, many people are vaccinated as of now. And uh, so we need to keep the BB measurement and BSL measurement. So we have like Omron measurement, uh, B machines, as well as like, you know, AccuCheck Active in our pharmacy. You can tie up, as I said, with the lab for lipid profiles to maintain. Uh, so if uh, the customer gets it for you, the lip, uh, the TGs and uh, LDLs and HDL values, well and good. But if you want to talk up with your uh, local labs, it will be good as well so that um, they can send it through to you based on consumer uh, customer's consent. And you can record that values in your software or uh, even Excel sheet if you're maintaining one. And... Uh, if you can give these clinical services to the customer and we need to do the doc documentation of data for each customer. As I said, we do it in our software. So education programs, uh, we can run the education programs with all uh, aspects of diet and medication adherence, etc. So looking at the business plan of uh, diabetes management, 
make sure you determine the customers. So if you have customers who are taking a regular uh, diabetic medications, yes, they are good customers for you. Uh, get support from the physicians. If you have uh, good doctors around you who can help you out, they want their uh, patients to come here and they want uh, the data for like six months or three months populated in a graph or tabular column sent to them. It's a great idea. And if they're really good physicians and they want that sort of approach from you, they can re, uh, you can uh, tell them about your program and uh, uh, that's the way to go. So market it to local clinics. That's a good business plan. Um, you can talk to the local clinics there. And encourage um, customers um, to like your social media adverts. Like, so what, uh, as, as uh, I've not informed uh, many people right now, but uh, we are doing with our customers do, uh, that we have a FB or Facebook page uh, for our pharmacy. And uh, I do advertise a lot of, um, right now I'm planning to uh, advertise a lot of things about if you're going to conduct a plan, uh, camp, camp in an apartment or a condominium, a big condominium, yes. Um, that they can come and check with their, uh, you know, check their blood sugars with us. And uh, we recommend a lot of uh, you know, uh, lifestyle measures about all those things you can advertise on social media and ask the customer to share or like it. And if there's any grand opening day, like if you're opening a new pharmacy, you can do these services along with that. And of course, uh, uh, and um, there are a lot of PharmD interns or even pharmacy graduates who are interested to uh, become interns in our pharmacy because we do a lot of these clinical services here. And uh, so we can get help from them um, to help. Uh, and it's also a learning curve, a learning curve for them as well to understand about these non-communicable uh, disease conditions. We also... Um, we can conduct group sessions. I have not done the asset as of now, but uh, in future, I do have plans about that. And continue of care is of paramount importance to us because uh, so once the customer feels that um, this pharmacist or the pharmacist working here in this pharmacy are really caring and uh, uh, they look after us for all the aspects in terms of recording the data, as well as like all the medication counseling and lifestyle counseling that's uh, that's where you, the, that clicks in. So uh, let's talk about consumer medicine information. I have uh, developed, uh, like what we get inside the uh, packages here in India has a lot of medical jargon in it. And uh, that's not really helpful for the customers as such because they won't understand any medical information or medical jargon inside that. So what we do in Western countries, like in Australia or any, any country for that matter, UK or US, we have something called consumer medicine information, as everyone knows, um, which is very, very like layman language. And I'm developing uh, a lot of them. I've developed about like 50% of the medications available here in India. And uh, it's a big process. It takes a couple, a couple of, I would say, uh, months or years to develop that. And that will be really helpful uh, so it talks about what is active ingredient, what, what to do if you miss the dose or what to do if you have leftover medicines or how to dispose it off or safe storage and a and lot of other things. It's really helpful in layman language. And we do have uh, this sort of uh, plan even in local languages in the near future. But that's only when uh, things expand. Okay, so uh, this is one of the our copyrighted thing, dose help system and like la like labeling and med profile. This is a copyrighted thing of Medox Pharmacy. So here, uh, like how how Amazon uh, is trying to have uh, um, what they call us. I think it's um, pill help. Uh, I believe I don't I don't remember the name exactly. Uh, but that's more, more, uh, in a sachet. But here in our pharmacy, we are planning to do this uh, once we have a good customer base. Uh, so basically, it has, uh, as you can see, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday till Saturday, and mon uh, morning, afternoon, evening, and night. So it it prints out all the medication of uh, that customer on that backside. In front, it's it has uh, blister packs. We, we we put all the medications and see it's personalized for each person each person. So all they have to do is they just pop it out. Uh, like how you can see, it's like a cut strip here. 
So they can take it um, while they're traveling or uh, if this is mainly for people who are taking more than four, four medications per day, uh, like if they have a blood pressure or diabetes or any other heart condition or any, anything else as such, which is a, a chronic medication, uh, it's really helpful, especially even it's very helpful for people who are uh, have dementia or they have Alzheimer's disease or people, uh, you know, uh, age old parents who live alone here if they have children abroad. So uh, that's really helpful for them because they can um, take uh, take the medications every day. They don't have to go and search for each, even for that matter, each labeled medicine, which we do separately, but we put everything inside here and that, that helps them to just pop it out and have it in the morning, afternoon or evening or night. So that's called dose help system. Uh, that's about it, uh, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. So any questions, I'll be able to answer that. Thank you very much, Tilak, for very for enlightening us. And it's great that you have brought in your experience and you're putting it into real pharmacy practice here in India. You are showing us that these things can be done in India too. And it's not too difficult. Thanks a lot once again. Yes. May I now request this is Manjiri, the Vice President of IPA, and Chairman of Community Pharmacy Divisions, to share a few thoughts of us. Thank you, Raj. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very glad with the way the program is going on, the session is going on. And thank you, everyone, for the overwhelming response. I take this opportunity to thank Goa State Pharmacy Council for this collaboration. I thank all my dear colleagues from IPACPD, Raj Vaidya, Ratnadi, uh, Yogendra, our new addition, uh, Tilak, Dr. Sudita, and Dr. Karthik for making this program, this session, highly successful. Huge thanks to all the dear pharmacists from Goa for this overwhelming response. Uh, you know what? Every time we float a new project or a new training program, we try it on you and it's a success. So we know this is a stepping stone for us. And that is because of uh, the consistent and uh, overwhelming response that we get from Govan pharmacists. Every time we have uh, collaborated with Pfizer or Abbott, we have tried out that new program in Goa and it has been always a success. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure you will love this program. Uh, regarding the community pharmacy division, Raj has already told you. And uh, we have been working through community pharmacy division for last maybe 15 years or more than that, actually 18 years. And I see a lot of challenges and a lot of potential and a lot of opportunities coming up all the time. Now, in recent times, maybe the threat, Tilak told you about the SWOT analysis, really. So the threat has increased. There have been many competitions. I mean, a lot of competition from the online pharmacies, discounts, then automation coming in the pharmacy and the chain pharmacy. So this is all going to happen. The Western world has gone through all this and they have still survived. I don't think any technology or any discount can replace the human interaction that you all have with your patients. And the bonding that we can develop with our patient is only through the services that we can offer to the patient. And Tilak just now gave you a lot of examples and he just not gave you the bookish examples, but he has been doing it in his pharmacy. And in Hindu pharmacy also many of those services you have seen. So. There is a lot of scope for our role in the public health. IPA has been always advocating for the larger role of pharmacists in public health. And now I see more and more opportunities because now with the COVID, we have proved our value in the healthcare and community pharmacy is shining ever than before. And that is because of the COVID and the way you all have worked. So salute to the work that you all frontliners have done in the COVID pandemic. 
Now, because I'm part of FIP, I can tell you FIP has been very supportive and very encouraging and looking at us that we would like the that we will improve our pharmacy practice and they are extending all types of support to us to improve the pharmacy practices right from the advocacy to the training to the policy matters everywhere FIP has extended its full support to IPA and to Indian pharmacists because they really want to transform the pharmacy practice in India and they don't want us to be seen as traders, shopkeepers, but they want us to see as healthcare provide providers. Recently, as you know, the COVID vaccine is coming. We all are talking about the COVID vaccine and uh, world over, maybe Tilak can also tell you, at least in 36 countries, pharmacists are also vaccinating the community. I mean, their role as vaccinator has been established in at least 36 countries. I'm conservating in telling you this number, but there mm -hmm. are more than 36 countries, I'm sure, in the world where the community pharmacist has been injecting the vaccine to the community. Now, since the healthcare workers in India are much less, there is a wide gap in the requirement and what we have. I'm sure the pharmacists can play a wider role even in vaccination. I know there is a struggle, there are challenges even on this path, but then definitely we can try and FIP is also supporting us. IPA has written letters to the government and government has issued a circular. Uh, in the list of potential vaccinators, they have mentioned the pharmacists. So we want to take this opportunity and we really want to uh, in, uh, improve and enlarge the role of the pharmacist in public health. And vaccination is, I think, one of the big opportunity for all of us. And we should work, try, we should try hard for it. And I promise you, if we take a first training program for vaccination, it will be for the Govan pharmacist because we are, we are sure that with Govan pharmacists, we are always successful because the way you are working and the way you all have that cohesive environment in Goa, thanks to your leaders like Raj Vaidya, Ratnadeep and many others, but you are all well-connected, you're all enthusiastic, you're all curious. I can see many questions coming up from the audience. So Goa is the place where we will start training the vaccine, training you for the vaccination. And I'm sure you will all be uh, supportive. You will all be very much uh, interested in it. And you will be coming forward and saying, yes, I want to be part of the vaccination wow. team. So a uh, lot, the bright future for us with a lot of struggle, but who doesn't have struggle? And there is, a, you know, they always say that the journey of thousand wow. miles starts with a single step. So we have taken the single step. You are all with us. We are all together. And uh, I also want to say, Raj has already told you, come forward and join us. We want to expand our community pharmacy team. And I'm very glad this year we have expanded the team already. Raj showed you some slides and Raj showed you uh, the executive committee of uh, CPD. But I'm very glad to tell you that we have some more experts with us already. And they are the ones who are talking to you as speakers today. So we have already enlarged our CPD team. And we are very welcoming of all of you, those who have special interest, who want to contribute to the profession through the platform of IPA. And we will work shoulder to shoulder uh, with all of you. And so you're most welcome to join IPA. You're always most welcome to join the community pharmacy division uh, with all of us. And thank you again to all of you for your enthusiastic participation. Thank you all my dear expert colleagues who are giving this session today. Thank you, Raj, and all the organizers today. And wish you, I'm sure the program is going to be very inspiring and interesting for all of you. And we, I'm sure we will be able to take question answers at the end. Thank you very much. And wish you a very happy new year in advance. Merry Christmas. Thank, Thank you, Mandiri. Over to you. Thank you for your leadership as well as encouragement. We're very happy to have the opportunity to listen to you. We now move on to the next speaker. It's Professor Sunita Srinivas. She's a B-Farm, M-Farm, and a PhD from Rajiv Gandhi University. She has done a PhD in pharmacy practice. She has served as a deputy director of Medicines Information Center at the Karnataka State Pharmacy Council for many years. 
and through that she has also initiated projects with the department of health under the india who essential medicine program and later on she has worked as an associate professor and professor at the pharmacy practice division of the rhodes university faculty of pharmacy that is in south africa and uh, after at, in 2017 after serving for 12 to 14 years in south africa she has come back now she is based in mysore she has also been very active and uh, has a small stint at who geneva a passion is rational use of medicines and also antimicrobial resistance she is now a member of the special interest group of ipa cpd and we are very happy to have her and her huge experience in the antimicrobial resistance stewardship project at karuna trust and is also uh, bangalore it is also associated with various health promotional activity it has been very friend power for two or three decades now and she has a rich experience to back her and i hand you over the session to sunita welcome thank you raj thanks for the kind in uh, introduction am i audible yes ma'am you are audible yes. okay thank you uh, so thank you so much and uh, what is wonderful about uh, talking today is um, taking it from where manjuri left it she said goa is the place i really think so to uh goa is not just a place for a wonderful vacation and all the happy memories i carry about goa and all the friends i have in goa but it's also the place to start something like this where we are moving forward uh in order to take uh, you know the the big strides that we need to be taking as a group so what i would like to start with uh while i share the screen and the technology starts assisting us is uh nelson mandela's um, uh, phrase I mean, his reputation, which says, "If you want to go, sorry, I'm just sharing this first. And when you start seeing this thing, please let me know." Uh, so Nelson Mandela's quote goes like this: "If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Because when you want to go far and you have to go together, it means you have to put a lot of things aside. The first thing to put aside is one's own ego." the second thing to put aside is the differences of opinion that comes with everybody's ego put into that center table so if you want to go far on a subject like universal immunization program for india the first thing we really have to put aside is our personal egos if at all they exist um and the second thing to definitely put aside is to you know stop blaming anything or anyone because we have a real problem here and i would like you to uh, please feel absolutely inspired in order to first look at where is this problem so that you know we all work together and we put our shoulders collectively to the same wheel and not put our shoulders to different wheels because then you know it's not moving in the same direction so i am absolutely uh, you know happy delighted and it's an absolute privilege to be here with all of you today and i look forward to this presentation uh, going smooth because we're all dependent on technology here sure we are you know in a state of a pandemic we have never known a pandemic because the last one happened 100 years ago so we don't know what it is to deal with but what we have to always always bear in mind is not just that the world is temporarily closed we have to bear in mind that an entire life is ahead of us post covid pandemic phase so if at this point we stop looking at things from a very myopic narrow view and stop being uh, you know tunnel having the tunnel vision and selective attention during times of despair we will start seeing that opportunity is knocking at our doors because the whole idea of opportunity is if we don't open that door if we don't hear that soft knock somebody else is going to open that door so we'll have to keep fighting uh, what a pharmacist has to do what a community pharmacist has to do the fact that pharmacists don't feature in the health programs uh, to the extent that they should be doing 
why are we even fighting this is something we have to ask so if this is that time when we can reflect on where are we at the moment listen to the soft opportunities and open that door and work together this too shall pass and when this passes when this pandemic passes we have a bright future for ourselves as individuals and as pharmacists as healthcare professionals now everybody starts off generally with objectives of their presentation and yes it makes sense to understand what the person is uh, going to present about but here i'm not presenting to novice i'm not presenting to people who need to understand i'm not presenting to uh, students in a classroom i'm presenting to people who are professionals i'm presenting to people who are passionate about what they do i'm presenting to people who are uh, leaders in what they do so when that is the crowd i'm looking at at this point then i need to look at something different and that difference is how do we take a step back so we all see the same picture and the whole picture now first of all to see that same picture and whole picture not only do we have to step back but we also want to go forward so to do that we have to ask the right questions because that will lead us to where we need to go so i am not going to just take that vertical slice of the cake and start off in the slide one to say what is the universal immunization program what are our problems what are the solutions i am not the expert simple and straight none of us individually are experts we all have different experiences and collectively we need to be going together it's not that i alone can make a difference or you alone can make a difference um we have to remember we are not gandhis or uh, barack obamas or you know people we, we are if we are in a different category it doesn't make us any less we are not less of a hero we are just the everyday hero uh, and the heroines but the whole idea is how do we go together how do we hold hands and go together so that we know where we are heading so i will want us to take a horizontal slice of this cake and not just the vertical slice of this cake so i want us to look at where are we in terms of health in this country because we before we talk about vaccination and preventable diseases we need to know where are we in terms of health in this country where are we in terms of vaccination in this country most important is let us ask ourselves the tough question how are we managing to continue to fail with the vaccination coverage this is not a program that started two weeks ago or two decades ago why are we constantly failing what is wrong with us so let us ask that difficult question to ourselves whose problem is it now can we just continue putting one index finger and blaming government other healthcare professionals politics in our profession no there are three fingers pointing at each of one of us and saying wake up it's time to wake up what is our role to move forward with the vaccination program in this country especially during a pandemic when the whole world is going ahead like manjuri mentioned about 36 countries with uh, pharmacists are front line in being vaccinated as well and where are we we are still debating about what do we need to be doing different better no it's time to do different and better in a much more dignified manner so let's look at the harsh realities of this country of what are our health problems so i have given you the web link so if anybody of you feel uh, the time and um, interest and effort i have put into making these slides is worth it for you where you don't have to replicate anything please ask raj or yogi to circulate these slides i have sent it across to them already so there is no need for all of us to sit and put the same amount of time doing the same job so please go uh, look at that web link i put in there to say uh, what are our major problems and when we look at these major problems where does our concept of uh, vaccine preventable conditions come in the second document i would strongly urge all of you to please take a look at is india health of the nation states so this is one of the best documents i have seen where state wise it tells us where do we stand and now that i am talking to all the wonderful uh, colleagues from goa i would like to talk a little bit more about goa so let's take a, a difference uh, look at the difference between 1990 and 2016 so in 1990 our life expectancy in goa the, for the females was 69.2 years and for the males is 66.1 years now in 2016 it has increased it has gone up to 78.4 for the females and 73 years for the males so uh, sure you know the life expectancy has gone up but the question we need to ask ourselves 
as pharmacists, as healthcare professionals is, have we just increased those years or are we actively aging? Are we aging actively, first thing? Secondly, if we're not aging actively and our diseases have gone up, then what's going to go wrong even further with the quality of life that we're going to have? So that's the first question we need to ask ourselves because the minute we ask ourselves that question, I would like you to visualize that door which said opportunity and there are there is a knock there. I want you to visualize that, please. Secondly, where are we with the under five uh, mortality rate? How has it changed from 1990 to 2016 in India and in Goa? So if you look at the line at the top uh, with the red and the yellow marking, that's for India and the way our um, infant mortality has been reducing in India. It's not where it's supposed to be, but that's where we are. But if you look at Goa, you're doing way better. So this is why Manjari keeps saying Goa is the place. Yes, accepted, agreed, Goa is the place. So look at the wonderful way in which you're bringing it down and it is at 13.5 in your uh, place. So that, that's absolutely nice too. Uh, smile about and keep working even further. Now let's take a look at where are the most deaths happening in the different age groups in 2016. So if you look at the first uh, pie chart, that is for zero to 14 year old uh, kids. And the biggest sector there in that pie chart is the 42% for the um, uh, neonatal uh, disorders. That's where majority of our children are dying because the number of preterm births are increasing and neonatal disorders are increasing and that's where we are losing our children too. So let's bear that in mind please. The next one I would like us to look at is where are we in Goa in terms of the death and disability across age groups. So if you look at the under five, uh, you're looking at the, the one which is red at the top is to do with the communicable maternal, neonatal, and nutritional diseases. So that's extremely high in children below five years. Now, of course, you know, we have combined all of it there. So we are also talking about maternal and nutritional uh, along with uh, neonatal and communicable. Now, if you look across the zone, you can see that what is turning out here is the blue section. What is the blue section? Non-communicable disease. And if we have to pay attention and listen to what Tilak was talking to us about, you know, how, how do we improve the quality of life of diabetic patients? That is where you should be hearing that knock on your door as an opportunity. Because if this is where we are in Goa with respect to non-communicable diseases, then there is no dearth of space or opportunity for you to be contributing as a healthcare profession. So this is something I wanted to uh, project here. The next one I wanted us to do uh, to take a look is um, just checking. Are you all able to still hear me? Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Are you all able to hear? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, right. So now what I would like us to do here is take a look at the difference between uh, where you're doing extremely well in Goa versus let's take uh, Bihar, for example, where our health indicators are um, what they are. And it, it doesn't mean we just, again, you know, bring up our index finger and as experts point out, it's about looking at the three fingers that point to each one of us and say, where are we going wrong for what is happening in Bihar? Why is it that in central India, we don't seem to get it right? Whereas in peninsula of India, we seem to be getting certain things right. What are we doing different? What are we doing better? How are we able to manage it? and therefore have that put out there. So take a look at Bihar on the left and Goa on the right. First of all, on uh, the axis there, for Bihar, it is zero to uh, 20, and 25 is where it has gone up. For Goa, it was zero to 10, where if you see it is 2.5, 5, 7.5, and 10. So that is where, you know, the charts may look similar, but you'll also have to look at the numbers on the axis. And uh, take a look at what is happening with their under five children. And uh, you know, when nutrition uh, issue is very high, when the neonatal deaths are very high, when premature births are very high, that is where we lose our children. And uh, so this is where we are at uh, the two uh, states. Now let's get back to Goa again. You know, for every slide I've given you the, uh, the source from where that information has been picked up. So you don't have to 
uh, look for that out. Now, what has been happening in Goa uh, between 1990 and 2016? So if you look at what was the number one problem in 1990, it was malnutrition. The second was air pollution. Third was wash. Wash is to do with unsafe water sanitation and hand washing. And the next one was dietary risk. Now, where are we in 2016? First one is high blood pressure. Second one is dietary risk. Third one is to do with diabetes. Fourth is malnutrition. So this is where we have changed our entire uh, transition of diseases. And we have increased our non-communicable diseases. So all of which gives you absolute space uh, for opportunity. Manjali was talking to us about FIP and what we should be aware. Uh, in September um, 2020, FIP has introduced these FIP development goals. And Bowen pharmacists, you being the leaders in the country, please take a look at this. I strongly urge you to please take a look at this because today we are uh, on the 27th of December. It's a nine. If you look at what I'm going to be talking about, it is uh, the 18th goal, which is again a nine, which is access to medicines, devices, and services. So vaccines will definitely be a part of that. So lo loads of nine and nine being my lucky number, I'm the happiest person here. Right, next, I would like you to also keep in mind the consistent uh, mirroring that should be happening in your brain with respect to the sustainable development goals, especially the SDG3, which is to do with the health, and the FIP development goals that we need to be working towards uh, for our progress. Now, I'm still with the health-related issues because I'm going to connect health to vaccines in just a minute now. Now we are coming to Sustainable Development Goal India Index. So if you look at what is happening here, it's talking about the social, economic, and environmental status of the country. And I've given you the URL as to where you would find it. And again here, Goa is definitely in that green zone because these are the states and the union territories that are doing well with the SDG. Doing well does not mean we have finished everything. It's done and dusted. There's nothing more to do. It just means it is relative in nature compared to the central Indian part of India. The peninsula of India, as usual, is performing better. So that is what it also proves all over again. Now we get to the vaccination. Before we get to the vaccination, let's look at what are the other factors that need to be borne in mind. 34 points, this is all from the SDG uh, index dashboard. So 34.7% children aged under five in India are stunted. These are our future generation. 34.7% of them are stunted, and this is not a joke. Sometimes you know we have to hang our heads in shame before we have any space for arrogance. I don't know where the arrogance comes from, if at all it is there, uh, or the ego comes from when this is the real state of affairs in our country. We we have a role in this one way or the other, and we have a role in solving this one way or the other. So more than one third of our children in this country are stunted. These are the next generation leaders. These are the next generation parents. Where are we heading with this kind of a, a number? 50.3% of pregnant women aged between 15 to 49 years are anemic. If the mother is anemic, what are we expecting to happen with the maternal mortality rate? It can't surely start decreasing. Now let's look at our maternal mortality ratio. It is 122. Let's look at um, uh, children uh, you know, uh, aged under five that die. It is 50 for every thousand live births. Now, most important, we're looking at physicians, nurses, and midwives for every 10,000 population is 38. Why are pharmacists not being counted here? If we are not being counted, what is wrong with us? So I'm going to keep asking that question. It's a collective question. It's not about pointing one index finger at somebody because three are pointed at each one of us. What is wrong with us? If midwives also get counted, but pharmacists are not getting counted in that uh, health professional ratio. Okay, now I'm finally getting into my topic, which is immunization. What is also wrong with us if between the ages of zero and five of children, our immunization cover is only 59.2%. This is not a program that started two weeks ago. It's not a program that started two decades ago, like I said at the beginning. We have been carrying on with this for decades and our immunization cover is only 59.2. Something is terribly wrong here and it can't continue like this. 
there is a way this has to stop and it only stops with the collective vision that we're going to have by contributing as pharmacists to this problem uh, problem solving now let's go back to the who essential medicines list for children so if we look at this list from 2019 we will see what are the different vaccines that are present let's look at why do we need these vaccines because we want healthier population we want the universal health coverage to be met because we want to look at what are the vaccine preventable conditions, which are the respiratory infections, diarrheal diseases, vector borne diseases, viral diseases, influenza, etc., for which we have these uh, vaccinations. We are also looking at health emergencies. And right now, in the times of COVID, we have to add to this list. So it's not just yellow fever and Ebola, uh, etc. It's also COVID that comes into this particular uh, point. Now, vaccination is about the life course. It is not just about children. It's not just about zero to five, etc. It starts with a woman when she becomes pregnant. So here we have pregnancy, childbirth, and uh, new birth. So it goes all the way up to the older people. Right. Now we're going to universal immunization program. So if we look at 1978, it started with the expanded program of immunization. In 1985, we called it the Universal Immunization Program. And let us have a great sense of pride because it is one of the largest health programs in the world. Just taking a sip of water, sorry. Now, who are being, uh, who are the primary beneficiaries of this? Infants, children, pregnant women. And I've given you the web links for where you will find what is the program about and also the web link for what are the different vaccines provided under this program in India. What is the importance? Because we're looking at uh, protection of children from life-threatening conditions which are preventable. I told you, but I want to repeat it. It is one of the largest immunization programs in the world and a major public health intervention in the country. It is something we have to be proud of, but it is also something that we have to contribute to. It can't be, it can't walk on its own. It needs more shoulders to that same need. Now it has become a part of the child survival and safe motherhood program in 1992. And then it became a part of the national reproductive and child health program. And since 2005, it was a part of the national rural health program. Several new vaccines have been introduced and there are also uh, the seven preventable diseases in effect. So if we keep saying it is the largest program in the world, what are we looking at? We're looking at 26 million newborns and 30 million pregnant women each year. These are huge numbers and we are able to do it. So we have to put, we have to pack our back somewhere for this. And it is translating into more than 300 million doses of vaccines each year. So this is an annual affair. This is not just, you do it once off and you can wash your hands. And we have 27,000 functional cold chain points where 3% are located in the district level and above, but 95% are below the district level. They are at PHCs, they are at CHCs, they are at urban health facilities and subcenters, and that's the best part of that news. There are more than 2.5 million health workers, and it is still not sufficient. So the point I want to raise is, yes, we are doing all of this right. So we need to pat ourselves on the back for doing it right. But we also have to bear in mind that we, are, we have a long way to go if only 59.2% of our children are being vaccinated completely. And there are 55,000 cold chain staff. So it's not like, you know, there's a dearth of people. But if 390 million doses needs to be administered every year, year after year, at 9 million sessions across the country for these 26 million newborns and 30 million pregnant women, then it needs more people. It needs each one of us serving this cause from different angles based on our own strengths and our own uh, capacities as well as our own interest. Now, if you want to know more about this, please take a look at the Universal Immunization Program Comprehensive Multi-Year Plan. So it is from 2018 to 2022. And I would like to introduce the uh, mission in the Danush, which started in 2014, because the whole idea was equity and improving the coverage for most hard to reach and underserved areas of the country. What, was, what were they attempting when they started all of this? They said that by 2018, they want to have 90% coverage. By 2020, more than 90% coverage. We are joking. We are kidding here. Because 
the SVG is showing it is only 59.2% coverage. It is nowhere close to 90%. So that is the loud knock of opportunity on our door. It's not knocking softly anymore. We are being deaf towards this, and therefore we need to you know, clear the wax and open the door. What are some of the things we need to know about this? When we look at the National Family Health Survey from 2005 to 2006, it was, uh, if you look at the full immunization coverage, it was only 44. By the time we got to 2015, 2016, it was 62. But take a look. By 2013, 2014, we were 65. We dropped. By 2009, we were 61 already. And now from 2009, if at 2016, we are still at 62, then something is wrong. With that. Something is terribly wrong in the way we are doing things and we need to change. We need to wake up to our reality. Take a look at the um, uh, information below with the um, map of India. In the National Family Health Survey 3, they, it shows that if there was just 43.5% uh, uh, coverage and then it has improved with the National Health, um, National Family Health Survey uh, 4, which shows the 62%. So, so uh, depending on which documents you're looking at, the SDG document talks about 59.2%, and this um, government document, I've given you the link below, talks about 62% coverage. So it's good to see that all of this red has uh, you know, decreased, and that red is only on the uh, northeastern region where things need to improve because of the geographical uh, location. Is there a difference between the urban and the rural differentials in the full immunization coverage? Definitely, yes. In the urban, it is going up between the uh, purple, which is the NFHC3, and the, uh, the beige, which is the NFHC4. So from 58, we went up to 64. But in the rural, uh, the increase is excellent. It has gone up from 39 to 61, but it is only 61. We need to go further ahead with all of this. Now, let us take a look at what are the different phases? How are they going about it? So I don't want to get into the details of this, but it, especially you know, the number of uh, children immunized and the number of children fully immunized. So that is one thing where we need to start paying attention to because that's where we have a lot of work to be done. Not that the pregnant women is less, but I, I just thought, you know, that is one thing that I wanted to draw your attention to. Everything important is uh, in this uh, slide. Now, what are the current costs and projected financial needs of this program? So what it talks about is, you know, that we are spending a lot of money. Where are we spending the money? It is on the immunization personnel, the vaccines, the injectable supplies, the transportation the training programs that happen, the social mobilization that is still not as effective as it needs to be, advocacy, communication activities. This is where we all have a role to play. Advocacy and communication activities, if we can start pushing for that, and I will tell you, in, even in my last slide, why do we need to take that up uh, a lot more? The disease surveillance, program management, maintenance or cold, uh, of the cold chain and the capital cost. So it's going to increase from this huge amount of 4,570 crore in 2013, I'm only talking about 2017, to 9,451 crores in, uh, in 2017. So it's not a small amount of money that we are spending on this program, but we are not getting the full benefit of it, and that's what I would like to highlight as well. We need to accelerate because this is about the accelerating universal immunization coverage by 2030. We're looking at sustainable development goals to be achieved. 2011 to 2020 was the decade of the vaccines, and that's how the global vaccine action plan was working. So from an, from a, from an international space to a national space, we had that big uh, push for making this happen. Now, we really need to look at how with the PHCs, the uh, UHCs, SDGs, uh, Universal Healthcare is UHC, and sustain, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. By 2030, we need to make all of this happen. So we need to keep equity at the back of our mind. Where are we getting it wrong and where are we getting it right? So if we look at our coverage uh, among the socioeconomic groups, the lowest, uh, I mean, in the uh, wealth uh, area, the lowest ends up with 53, and the highest in the wealth end up with 70% coverage. So it shows that if you have the money, your children are definitely vaccinated. But when poor people are dependent on the program, we are only reaching 50. Is caste and tribe playing a role? Of course it is. 
uh, scheduled caste, it is at 63, scheduled tribe at 56. That itself speaks for itself. You don't have to look any further. Is the education of the mother and the parent playing a role? For sure it does. So if the mother or the parent is secondary or more complete, then 67% of the children end up getting full immunization coverage. But if there's no education, it's only 52. This clearly shows where we need to be putting in our efforts, communication, advocacy, health literacy. It's not about literacy of the mother. Is she a BSc graduate, couldn't care? Does she understand her child needs vaccination? That's what we need to focus on. So it's about health literacy and not just literacy. If we look at BCG coverage, it is 91.9. But if we look at a fully immunized child, it is 62. What are we missing in this? We need to ask those tough questions. Why are we missing it? What are the reasons for those missed vaccinations? It is the adverse effect uh, with uh, following the immunization. That is one of the first things. If you see this 33%, this huge chunk here is adverse effect uh, for the uh, following immunization. Second is awareness in information gap. So this is exactly where, if you agree with me, is what we are trained for. We may not be trained specifically for vaccines, but that's where we need to pick up the books and start reading. Because we need to look at how do we address that awareness and information gap. It is the oper operational gap. So those in the um, hospital settings and those in the government programs uh, who are here in the session, you have a major role to play here. Children are tra traveling, people are refusing. So that's a small percentage. People refusing is a small percentage. So we don't have to fight the battle there. We have to fight the battle where it is to do with adverse event following immunization apprehension and awareness and information gaps. So let's put our energies there. Now, let's also put our energies into the fact that a lot of diseases will be back. There'll be re-emerging diseases because of the climate change. We are not paying attention on how we are living on this planet. We are not paying attention on how to tread carefully and how to tread light. We don't seem to understand that. It's all about here and now. It's all about the materialism and the GDP race. Time to stop racing. And that is, I think, what COVID is telling us. Stop racing. There is only so much the planet can provide. And we are just burning it inside out when we don't have another home to go and run and hide. So something is really wrong with us to be at the top of the food pyramid, to be the most rational species on this planet and still be doing what we are doing because vaccination is linked to this. If vaccination hesitancy is a problem on one side and there are vaccine preventable diseases that will re-emerge, then we better, better, better take care about this. So something we should all be aware of is the a global routine immunization strategy and practices. And I've given you the links for that. We all have a role in understanding the why and the what of the vaccination and the immunization strategy. We have a role in understanding the who and the how about this. And by when? Because we have to get there by 2030. How will we get there? Only when we walk together. We can't walk alone and get there fast. The second uh, point I, I, was, I was talking to you about the AFI. Uh, the adverse event following immunization. This is where, as pharmacists, we come in. We have to play a crucial role. And in this particular document from the government, there's not even a mention of the pharmacist. Time we fight this battle from a different angle. If something is not working, let go and start fresh. And start fresh with renewed energy, renewed ideas, and more strategically. So let's start investing on understanding what is our role with this? If the death and the other related issues with respect to the AEFI is consistently there, but the numbers are very small, we are only talking about 1,564. We are putting in 300 million doses of vaccine every year, but these pathetic numbers are not telling the whole story because we are not capturing the data the way it should be captured. And that is where pharmacists play a major role in pharmacovigilance. Is the money any less? Of course not. Take a look at how much of money we are putting into all of this program. So it's not the money that is the issue. Where are we also wasting certain things? And can we reduce that wastage is where the pharmacist needs to start looking at it. So take a look at the price per dose of each of these vaccines. And then what is the wastage rate? 
and what is the coverage rate in 2017 so time we all put attention into learning and understanding because the better we are as students the better we are as professionals what are some of the other problems human resource gap for sure we are the mo one of the most populated countries and then we talk of human resource gap now that's an irony that we don't want to be going into. We have to look different, think different. Low capacity to supervise, monitor, implement. Inadequate supervisory visits. Records not maintained poorly. What is wrong with us? We're talking about technology for everything, and then we say records not uh, maintained. Community participation and IEC are still major constraints. Community participation, I understand. How can IEC be a major constraint? I mean, this program has been going on for decades. So what is it that we are missing and what is it that we need to do different and better? What are our missed opportunities? Parents are not aware. They are not aware of the fact that there are vaccines, it is efficacious, there's a schedule for it, and their children need it. Unsuitable timings of vaccination. People are working. So how do we make it happen? We, are, we want to act independent. You know, government does its things, private does its things, NGOs do their things. Come on, it's time to move. Put our egos aside. Put our differences of opinion aside. It's not about who's the boss here. We don't need so many chiefs here. What we need is committed humans who are working for the same cause. If we can take care of our children, keep them safe, keep them healthy, we have a better country to live in. How much of that is a rocket science, I don't know. There is low coverage rate, high dropout rates in many states. For Goa, I've given you the link there. If you want to, if you're interested to go and look at what is happening with the, uh, you know, the performance in Goa, etc., uh, you need to register. Uh, it's a free registration process, and then get it going. This is the last slide with respect to information. I want us to stop where the problem is. I want us to stop, think, and move forward. There is a problem in the demand side of issues. There's a problem with the supply side of issues, and there are the other problems. If people don't feel there's a need to vaccinate their children, there is a problem. That is 28.2%. If people are not aware of the vaccines, then it's a huge problem, 263 That's the biggest thing. Not knowing where to go for immunization is 108 and then it keeps reducing. Why? And then where is our next job? Vaccine not available, 6.2%. So we have a job there. We have to make sure that the stock out of vaccine does not happen because we are all working towards the bin cards and updating and looking at how do we keep things moving? How will this be keep functional, will stay functional? Uh, it, it is only when we each put our shoulder to that same wheel, not different wheels. So with that, the information bit is done. But two things I would like to leave you with is the motivation and the inspiration. Stay home, stay safe, yes, but stay inspired. Stay inspired because every day if we wake up just to do the same that we did yesterday, then something is wrong with us. If we know how, to, how we took care of yesterday, most part of our brain should not be focused on what we had to do yesterday and we still have to do today. Most part of the brain should focus on what is yet to be done. So get inspired, stay inspired, yes, but start inspiring. There is a long way to go and we have to go together. So it's time to start inspiring. A goal should scare you a little, but excite you a lot. Let's get excited about this. If our children and our next generation is where we are leaving this dangling mid-air dangerously, time we wake up to the reality and take on the challenge and do things. We can't start with, I won't do it. We have to get to, I will do it. But to get to that, it can't be a quick, easy, uh, single step process. There are processes that we have to go through as individuals, but let's do it quickly. Let's catalyze that process. When does it get catalyzed? When I have to struggle as an individual, I have to catalyze it very hard. But if I'm in a team of committed people, I don't have to struggle that hard because that is where the start inspiring starts to work. It's about the complete commitment that we have in place. The last one is those who look outside dream, but those who look inside awaken. Time to awaken. Let's not put our heart in a cage where the brain decides what happens. And we choose to do the materialistic route and we choose to dominate the GDP driven route. Time to stop. COVID is asking us to stop and think. Let's, let's do that. This too shall pass. COVID is not here forever. 
our resolve, our resolution, our resourcefulness, and our togetherness will take us forward. We didn't possibly have a good year, yes, but it, we are still in a better off position compared to billions on this planet who don't have a meal to think of. So this too shall pass. When things are bad, remember, it won't always be this way. Take one day at a time. When things are good, remember, it won't always be this way. Enjoy every great moment. And I sincerely, sincerely thank the IPA CPD team, all of you, Manjari, Raj, Yogi, all of you who make this place tick because you are committed to what you're doing. I am so grateful to be a part of this team. And I really thank all of you who have attended the session. Please leave the session inspired. Start inspiring people. Let's think different. Let's think better. We have a better tomorrow to work towards. Thank you all. I really look forward to interacting with you at the end of this. Thanks. Thank you, Sunita, for exhaustively taking us into the immunization, health issues, and strongly urging us to take our role seriously one day at a time, but at the same time, do it quickly. Thank you very much. We now have the next speaker, that is Dr. Karthik Rakam, who is a young, dashing, and dynamic personality. He is from the first batch of PharmD, the six-year course Doctor of Pharmacy, which was started. He passed out in 2014, and he has through a, for a, throughout been very restless to do more, to do better, so that pharmacists and the level of uh, the profession can increase. Currently, he is the president of the Pharmacon Society for Pharmacy Practice, and through this, he is doing a great lot of work. In between, he had joined an academia, but he found that that was not his cup of tea. He is into teaching yet, but he is teaching without boundaries. He has taken uh, hundreds of sessions for PharmD students all across the country. He is well linked to PharmD students across the country. And he is an inspiration, not only to those students, but also to us. Because his drive is an inspiration to me also. He is also the medical advisor of Health Cloud AI and uh, also of GEO, a Clinical Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Care Initiative, which is started by IIT graduates who have US returns. The focus is on how clinical pharmacy or the benefits of pharmacists can reach out to the uh, poorest as well as those in real need of it. So he is pioneering clinical pharmacy in our country. And uh, hats off to him for taking this step and his consistent passion. He is also a very active member of IPA CPD as a special interest group member. And we now look forward to hear from Karthik on drug-induced nephrotoxicity. Over to you, Karthik. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, so can you hear me? Yes. Very well. Is the audio clear? Yeah. Hear your screen. Okay. Hello, Raj, sir. You need to stop your screen. So, can you see my screen? Oh, I have to stop sharing mine first. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would like to start my thank by uh, thanking all the community pharmacists because I personally have an health issue. And I have been using medications more than so a few days I might have skipped taking my meal, but in last 20 years I never missed taking my meal. And more importantly, never found out of stock situation in whichever farm I went to purchase my medication. So I want to thank all of you. And next I would like to thank I community pharmacy division and go as pharmacy pharmacy. So this is just the second or third time I'm at the pharmacy.
So yeah, I'm, and most of you might already be aware of uh, certain points which I am going to discuss. This can be a refresher for you. All the points. My goal of this presentation is to make you aware of few drugs as nephrotoxicity. It's later, when you dispense the drugs, this uh, should pop up in your mind. Might cause nephrotoxicity or not necessarily nephrotoxicity, any other. And you should aware and alert the patient and measures that they can avoid. Really, when I talk to students, I say, let's say a patient has diabetes, goes to a hospital, diabetics uh, gets complicated, he dies of his disease. Say his soul will rest in peace because at least he died because of his disease. But if we give him an insulin or some medication, it can overdose and leads to his death. Definitely his soul will not rest in peace. He did not die of his disease but he died because of an intervention uh, which you have given. More importantly, that could have been prevented. There are a lot of studies show preventable reasons causing deaths of deaths every year. Yeah, we don't have much stats, but I have seen many cases where a lot of deaths could have been prevented if I was alert. So not always about knowledge. Most of the time, it is about presence of mind and some basic knowledge. So today, I will be talking about induced toxicity. Why we should be talking about that is uh, a lot of drugs can cause it and more available over the counter. Has been increased in drug induced nephrotoxicity in a few years. And major of causes of uh, major drug classes that can cause nephrotoxicity are antibiotics, NSAIDs, AC inhibitors, agents, especially in hospital. And Tiloxar was actually pointing out to choose a lot of patients with inhibitor, a lot of patients with many other conditions. One of the most common use of OTC medication. And it, when, when it comes to AKA, when the percentage of all AKAs are of drugs. And the other drug which can cause AKA significantly is amino glycosides. So, this is the list I've classified into different headings uh, acute tubular necrosis, antibiotic, mentioned there. A lot of cases with amphotericin. And also TNFO and immunosuppressives like cyclosporin and and then hemodynamically mediated kidney injury can be caused by the AC inhibitor, ARB, and immunosuppressives like and obstructive neuropathy can be caused by sulfonamides and also indinavir, which is known to sulfonamides and indinavir, which common causes nephrolithiasis or the stones. So next time when you come across these drugs or when you drugs either in community, so you should just, these drugs might cause toxicity and you should, the ways to prevent them. The drugs which can cause toxicity, lithium, and acid, antibiotics, cifrofloxacin, PPA is most commonly used. So generally, when I talk to students, I say when you go to a doctor, without even looking at you, not commenting on them, they write a proton pump inhibitor, an antibiotic, a vitamin supplement, and then they will ask you what is your problem. It means first three things might not be for your problem. These are most commonly used everything you see. It has a PPA and the other drugs like loop diarrhea. Cyclosporin, lithium, hydralazine, propyl thiourine, cyclosporin, and all of these nephrotoxicity. So the goal of putting these two slides is to give you a list of most common drugs which can cause nephrotoxicity. And this is general common clinical presentation present with decline or stands for glomerular filtration rate. So that shows how effectively your kidneys are functioning. And in humans, there is no method to directly measure GFR. 
but we estimate it by using other so patients present with the, uh, decline <coughs> GFR increased serum creatinine is normal values are 0.5 to 1 per day. Red urine nitrogen can also increase. So, but the problem with all of them is they reflect the kidney function. So, kidney injury might have happened two weeks back. At the time there is creatinine and BUN, a lot of damage might have already occurred. So, it is very important to catch it early. And the symptoms patients mostly present are with anis and shortness of edema can happen with fluid retention and urine uh, urine output is the common sign. And uh, coming to labs, if serum creatinine increases by more than 0.3 mg per dl in 48 hours time, I mean, let's say today it is one. 48 hours time or within 48 hours time, 0.3 it means it has increased by 0.3 so we can suspect injury to or greater than 50 percent increase from the baseline and can be normal and the increase can be within the normal value let's say baseline is 0.6 and it became 1.2 1.2 is still normal but when we compare it with baseline has almost doubled. So even in that case, it is considered so 1.5 times increase from the baseline or greater than 50% increase from the baseline. This is one more um, way of assessing uh, renal injury and also urine output, which is 0.2 ml per kg per hour for more than or in a day it can be 400, 400 ml. So that knee injury. So this is how whatever may be the underlying cause present with. So to summarize, there is decline in GFR, increase in serum creatinine, increase in blood urine, and there is decreased urine output. And this is because we are talking about drug therapy, we should correlate with adding of uh, drug therapy and seeing these changes. So if these changes happen after starting the drug, it mostly uh, Drug induced uh, causes. Sorry. <clears throat> so, what are the consequences of nephrotoxicity? Most of the time it is reversible, but fortunately, sometimes it can go to ESRD. So, I have seen at least 20 30 patients during my posting in dialysis in my 50 year farm D. And few of the cases were to and the two in children. So, that was very unfortunate. Like, I they used to come thrice in a week and it is a procedure which involves a lot of complications. And they developed some infections and they and their family had really tough with um, so that is the consequence. So though it is rare and reversible and there is no way of And the other consequences never show if serum creatinine increases by more than 0.5 mg per day, irrespective of all other risk factors, there is 6.5 times of death, and there is at least 3.5 days in length of hospitalization. And in US, the US, it says it costs more than 7,000. Uh, even taking into consideration other risk factors like age and other other conditions. 1.5 mg per day can cause all these complications. So, how to prevent this is the most important point. Any drug induced, so there are two aspects to it which causes toxicity and the patient. Really, only two factors are involved the drug factors and the patient factors. Drug factors we have already seen, we have about the drug nephrotoxicity. And as a pharmacist, we should be aware of patient specific factors which increase the risk of nephrotoxicity and make sure we are careful with such patients and important some 
which can decrease the risk of mental toxicity. So one simple uh, aspect is maintaining adequate hydration. So we don't have to uh, suggest any other drug or do some great intervals. We maintain proper hydration. We can prevent uh, issues with nephrotoxicity. And in hospital setting, especially, I have seen not just nephrotoxicity, but toxicity with other drugs. Major reason was failure to adjust the doses of drugs according to renal. Because most of the time physicians are busy, they don't have time to visualize the doses of drugs for patients. It was my daily uh, job. So we, every day I used to adjust the doses of at least two or three drugs. Patient does not unnecessarily be exposed to higher doses than treatment. We will talk about, I will not talk about all the classes of drugs which can cause nephrotoxicity, but I will be talking about important drugs. Most important ones are aminoglycosin, samples are gentamicin and acid. And if, let's say, if 100 patients take amicacin, any aminoglycoside antibody out of that, it's 10 to 25 nephrotoxin. And this is seen five to 10 days after initiation of therapy. And how can we notice it? By monitoring serum creatinine and red urine androgen progressively rise. And the other common sign is a decreased urine output. It can also show blood in urine and And the mechanism is not really important to know. Acute uh, causing cell. Important. Whenever you dispense an amino glycoside, so it is important to have any of these. So it just takes a minute to ask them if they have pre existing kidney disease or diabetes or if they are elderly, their nutritional status, hypoalbuminemia, any liver disease, and most importantly, if they are dehydrated and any electrolyte abnormalities when magnesium. So all these factors increase the risk of nephrotoxicity with aminoglycosides. I will try to give you examples. In patients, I have very less exposure. I've seen patients developing ADRs with drugs like amphotericin. Another important risk factor for any drug induced class is the concomitant medication switch. Let's say patient has an infection with glycoside and same patient has hypertension for which he, for which he takes how there is increased of developing nephrotoxicity. So all these drugs, aminoglycosides in con, uh, combination with amphotericin B, vancomycin, cisplatin, and N uh, increase the risk of patient developing aminoglycosides. And other important thing is prolonged therapy, especially in my hospital days, whenever a doctor writes an antibiotic in Simple thing I used to do was note down the start date and keep a count on number of days. And after the duration of therapy is over, so I used to alert the doctor, sir, therapy is over, let's stop it. And I have realized most of the time, healthcare professionals are interested in adding the drugs and not stopping them. So they don't really to stop drugs and most of the interventions I did was the duration of therapy was over. And to prevent it is always best to choose antibiotics based on their once the sensitivity reports are there, you should try to avoid uh, drugs which can cause toxicity. In case of aminoglycoside, the alternatives are fluoroquinolone antibiotics like ziprofloxacin. But here with fluoroquinolones, I have seen few cases of glycemia, either hyperglycemia or hyperglycemia. And as we have seen, dehydration is the most important risk factor. So, one simple intervention can be used to avoid volume depletion and the total uh, dose of glycoside is within the acceptable limit. 
to avoid concomitant nephrotoxic growth. And there are some other strategies which can decrease the risk. A once daily dosing versus aminoglycosides fall into a class of antibiotics called dependent antibiotics. They work well, achieve high concentration. You don't have to maintain the tight concentration towards the day, throughout the day. So it is best to give all dose at once. So kidneys are exposed to high doses only for the phase where you give all dose at once. And that is shown to decrease the risk of nephrotoxicity. Uh, regimens can be preferred over multiple uh, daily dosing regimens. <clears throat> and if patient develops AKA after giving an am amnoglycoside, it is better to discontinue them and go for the other alternate. Next two important classes of drugs which are widely used and can pass inhibitors and ARBs, which are the preferred drugs for hypertension. Almost every patient who comes to hospital, at least in patients, and most of the patients in the community, they have either hypertension or diabetes, and most of them might be using inhibitors and ARBs. So in heart failure, actually, guidelines recommend this inhibitor as preferred drug. Every patient with heart failure will be on inhibitor, and if that patient also has volume overload or fluid overload, they will be given a diuretic. So these patients are already receiving two drugs which may increase the risk of uh, causing AKA. So the stat source almost one fourth of the patients out of hundred every out of hundred patients with heart failure, 25 patients develop AKA after raising a bitter sunny. This is more if patient has bilateral renal artery stenosis or unilateral renal artery. Actually, this is the most important, most intense, inter, uh, interesting concept that I have in my body. Uh, how the risk of AC inhibitors and ARP induced nephrotoxicity can increase. And the important point here is when we start an AC inhibitor, it is expected that creatinine rises by 30%. It's not an idea that shows drug is actually working. Within three to five days of initiating an AC inhibitor, creatinine does not increase by 10 to 20 to 30 percent it means the drug is not really working but problem arises when it increases more than 30 percent after one or two weeks of initiation of therapy so we should do it. so we should not discontinue ac inhibitor and arb if creatinine increases by if it increases beyond 30 percent then it is a cause of concern and we should stop the drug so I have seen a lot of uh, cases we had where we had to stop AC inhibitors here with AKI. So here I will try to explain the mechanism. Hoping uh, it will create little limits. So can you see a uh, on the screen? Yes, sir, we can see. Okay. The glomerulus, this is where filtration will happen. Filtration to happen, it should flow. So, blood flows to me through efferent arterial, A F F E R E N T, and it goes out through. So, when blood comes through efferent arterial into glomerulus, it exerts certain pressure, and that pressure will be the driving force for filtration. So to achieve good filtration, we should maintain enough pressure. That pressure to be maintained, two important things. Efferent should be dilated. When efferent, A-F-F-R-E-N-T, this should be dilated. When it dilates, it can easily flow into glomerulus. And efferent should be constricted. If it is constricted, it offers more resistance and blood does not easily go to efferent. This makes sure that blood remains in the glomerulus causing so when we give an ACE inhibitor so all of us know they inhibit formation of angiotensin 2 and angiotensin 2 is responsible for constriction of efferent artery so once the effect is lost and can then get dilated all the blood which comes through glomerulus can easily pass through efferent 
less plate is available in the glomerulus because less plate is available it does not exert enough pressure and minimizes filtration how as inhibitors ar bits cause nephrotrophy and this will become really significant when there is a problem with renal blood flow and renal blood flow is normal then there is less risk but in conditions like your or dehydration is reduced renal blood flow or when there is renal artery stenosis there is decreased renal blood flow when there is decreased renal blood flow means less amount of blood is reaching glomerulus so it is important to maintain whatever little amount of blood reaches glomerulus it's important to maintain it there so that it exerts enough filtration so but in such situations if you use an ac inhibitor and arb efferent gets dilated and all the blood or whatever little bit that comes to glomerulus will easily go through and uh, compromising the filtration pressure leading to renal failure so these are the risk factors as we have seen once when renal blood flow is normal we don't have to do it whenever because of whatever reason renal blood flow decreases in such cases ac inhibitors and arb is contraindicated at the conditions which Uh, such thing are bilateral renal artery stenosis it means there is some blockade in renal artery that reaching glomerulus is decreased the patient has a solitary functioning kidney and if there is a stenosis to blood supply to that kidney also compromise renal blood flow increasing the risk of and all the conditions which increase the effective arterial uh, blood volume your dehydration excess use of diuretic causing volume depletion and ascites where all the fluid moves from and if patient has pre existing kidney disease and other common thing is patient might be using another nephropathy and cause increased risk so what can be done we can whenever we start any drug it is best to start with low dose gradually titrate according to response so in ac inhibitors therapy can be initiated with enalapril 2.5 mg and gradually we can take it up to the metal doses over two to four weeks time and it is very important to monitor sodium potassium because these drugs can cause hyperkalemia and in hospitalized patients Done daily, but I don't know practically how can it is possible. I can say in outpatients at least every two to three days this parameter should be checked, and we should not be using uh, concomitant drugs like NSAIDs, diuretic, and most important, hydration should be which increases. So so far, if I had to tell one point uh, which can decrease the risk. it need it is maintaining adequate hydration and now we have so far seen amino glycoside uh, induced tubular necrosis and inhibitor arb induced uh, hemodynamically mediated now we will be seeing nsaids so all of you know these are one of the most commonly and widely used so in india i could not find real data so but at least there was some stat which shows 30 million people take in acid and 5 lakh to 2.5 million people develop some degree of nsaid induced nephrotoxin us sample examples all of us know ibuprofen etc and patients typically uh, present with decreased urine output you can just observe their legs their notice so how they act is similar to uh, how they cause nephrotoxicity so their general mechanism acts they inhibit cox enzyme and because of that there is decreased in synthesis of prostaglandins i2 and e2 and function of prostaglandins is vasodilator they dilate afferent artery as afferent arteriole is dilated Uh, there is normal renal blood flow leading to better filtration once of uh, ac inhibitors you inhibit cox enzyme 
vasodilatory proteins are not produced print is not dilated so there is decreased blood flow to injury and these are the risk factors and when you dispense an ace inhibitor if some person comes to the pharmacy any medication for pain so we should be very careful if the patient also has condition say age greater than 60 years pre existing kidney disease liver disease with ascites the known case of heart failure patients look uh, patient might be taking a diuretic as a hypotetic patient has any of these risk factors it is better to avoid when i said asking them to uh, go with and not the other nesets which so as far as possible paracetamol can be used in patients with high risk least possible dose for shortest possible duration and as i said the drug is start and nobody bothers to tell them to stop it continue to take it for years and months and finally they end up with renal dysfunction which cannot be reversed and at the same time consistently we have been seeing so use of these drugs along with other drugs like ac inhibitor patient has hypertension which is using an ac inhibitor or a diuretic develops pain and then he goes to a pharmacy and takes an ns now patient will be cause nephrotoxicity so there will be very high risk uh, here all of you will agree pharmacy is not just a business but an opportunity to every day and there are more patients coming to a community pharmacy you will be more patients every day than any number of patients seen in a hospital we move towards life as a business and So as Sunita Ma'am was telling you, I'm just going to talk about the responsibility of each, each and every one of us, and especially as a pharmacist, as responsible as any other health professional, uh, to patient does not suffer because of drug induced. The this is the feedback I got from. So most of the pharmacists think we're going to. at least in my experience that was not true that depends on and the kind of knowledge we have and if we are not looking to encroach their space everybody will be happy to make us part of their team and contribute so on the left you can see this actually is a nephrologist and gold medal winner in internal medicine for in his nephrology so this is the statement at the down So I want you and people prevent medical errors committed by good doctors. Even good doctors can commit error, and it can be prevented by. Here he said, "Young people, but he meant it." So these are few of my students who prevented lot of errors. So I found interventions in every area that uh, you have shown. We can find out. I do on different kind of errors, and one of those aspects was errors. one more feedback from another of my student so calculating the doses and making sure the appropriate doses to so these testimonials are these feedbacks are just to tell you what's happened we prevented all it needs is written knowledge importantly presence of mind and on the left again i'm telling this feedback is from a leading nephrologist from hyderabad so so we are as responsible as doctors and any other person patients get the best out of the medications and so for an error to reach patient from doctor to be it passes through multiple but in community pharmacy the most important thing is before patient starts their medication pharmacist will be the last person so even if errors have happened at the prescriber level or at the uh, other levels because you are the last person to see it prevent it 
for you there might be uh, that prescription might have gone through many hands but it is finally you who will be dispensing the medication to patient and you are the last person even if lot of errors have happened behind you but because you are the last person if you are responsible alert then you those errors so these are my and thanks for giving me the opportunity to what it is important for you to make a list of all the drugs that and when you come across the drugs as i said drug industry to drug factors patient factors you already know you are dispensing a drug it is time talking to patient to identify they have any patient specific factors which can increase the risk of nephrotoxicity one a patient specific factor which is common in every uh, in every case we have seen dehydration and use of concomitant medication toxicity so if we can identify and alert the patient asking them to stop using drugs if they are not really required be saving their kidneys so as i said i have seen lot of during my post there because of long term nsaid abuse they ended up ready they had to suffer and with them their family had to suffer so they were most full days during my internship so thanks and that ends my presentation i'll be happy to thank you very much karthik for a lucid presentation and making us alert where we as pharmacists should look out for kidney disease and what we are dispensing wonderfully illustrated and uh, we are very grateful to you for taking out your time and being with us here in the chat chat box yogendra has just put in the feedback form link so i request all of you to click on that link and send in your feedback and once again i thank all the participants for their overwhelming participation patience in uh, waiting and hearing all the lectures my sincere thanks to everybody in the ipa cpd as well as goa state pharmacy council for their cooperation and uh, good coordination to make this program a success we are at 5 o'clock and i think we have finished wonderfully well in time i would also like to thank the, the three speakers mr tilak sunita and uh, dr karthik for their wonderful presentations being here with us throughout and their wonderful insights and guidance that they have given us thank you to all of you see you again at the next cep and uh, please do not forget to fill in the feedback form which has been posted in the chat box if at all you don't get the feedback form link please uh, whatsapp one of us and we will be happy to assist thank you have a good day